part three in the new normal series by Oakworth Capital Bank. With massive deficit spending by the federal government and sharp revenue declines for public entities across the country, it is hard to imagine taxes not going up at some point, but probably not until after the election. As such, don't be surprised to see both individual and corporate tax rates eventually increase. The political pull and the lack of true economic insight in Washington is simply going to be too strong. While the CARES Act was being negotiated in Congress, there was an intense focus to ensure the money would go towards, not towards, executive compensation or share repurchasing. As a result, many corporations immediately announced the suspension of their share buyback programs. Now, this is incredibly important. As the economy slowly recovered from the 2008 financial crisis, many companies found it difficult to significantly grow their top line revenue. In order to increase their earnings per share more rapidly than they could by revenue growth alone, companies used a substantial portion of whatever remaining profit they had to shrink the number of outstanding shares in the open market. This has been a major driver of per share earnings growth for the past 11 years. So if share buybacks aren't going to be part of the equation for increasing earnings growth, we can expect a headwind on share prices moving forward. While the impact of COVID-19 will vary between companies and economic sectors and industries, the pressure on margins will be considerable across the board. From the need and the, and the desire to social distance, the need to constantly sanitize surfaces, reduce capacities in stores, etc., will all put downward pressure on margins by increasing overhead. Social distancing and the move towards remote working over the last few months has dried up merger activity. After all, it is difficult to get everyone in the same room to make a deal when nobody wants to, well, be in the same room. As we start to reopen the economy, we should expect to see merger activity increase. Many companies have been left vulnerable with the strain placed on weak balance sheets, and leverage has, strung, has swung from sellers to the buyers. The companies with strong balance sheets will look to gain new competitive advantages by acquiring weakened players, which could fill a void in their current offerings while eliminating unnecessary overhead. The other player that will look to take advantage of the current situation will be the rapidly growing private equity market. Capital in the last few years has been flowing out of hedge funds and into private equity funds. Until the COVID-19 crisis, private equity is running out of publicly traded targets that made financial sense to take private. That seems to be changing. We look for a significant increase in private equity deals over the next 12 months or so. Between mergers and publicly traded companies getting purchased by private equity firms, the trend of declining number of publicly traded companies will continue. The other cons consideration for mergers is political. Larger mergers, larger mergers need governmental approval, and the general thought is Republicans are more willing to allow larger mergers, and Democrats tend to be against merger of larger corporations. With the election in November and the uncertainty of who will control the White House and both chambers of Congress, larger mergers may happen sooner rather than later. Just a few weeks ago, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren and New York Representative Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez announced the Pandemic Anti-Monopoly Act, which would place a moratorium on mergers of, uh, on companies with a market capitalization of $100 million or greater. The bill has very little chance of becoming law, but it is another reminder that elections do have consequences. The COVID-19 crisis has also placed a spotlight on our reliance on China for many of the items that are now deemed of national security. There will be a renewed focus on getting many of these products produced in the United States, or at least in countries that we have a better relationship with, like maybe Mexico. This will create a small manufacturing renaissance in the United States. This will be important as many of the jobs that are being lost in the service and hospitality industries probably won't return, and those workers will need to retool their skills to find employment. This may take some time, and one of the results will be an unemployment rate that will remain stubbornly higher than many expect as we recover from this economic shutdown. In a trend that has been in place for some time, the demand for skilled workers will continue to remain high, with low unemployment rates and much higher wages than the lower educated, unskilled workforce. This transition from service jobs to manufacturing jobs will exacerbate that situation. The large pool of unskilled workers available to fill any new jobs created will keep wages low, while increasing demand on the smaller pool of skilled laborers will allow for above average wage increases. Don't be surprised if this is a major topic of debate in the presidential election. As in any recession, some industries will be impacted more than others. This crisis is no different. 
the current sectors that we see facing dramatic changes include restaurants. On average, not a very high margin business. The reduction in capacity, forced compliance with new safety regulations, and potentially lower demand will make it difficult for many restaurants to not only reopen, but to survive. The buffet-style restaurants, so popular in so many places, will be forced to completely rethink their business model. Also impacted would be retail. The continued trend towards online shopping places more and more pressure on the traditional brick-and-mortar retail outlets. The demise of the mall concept will be set into overdrive and foot traffic likely won't return to pre-pandemic levels for some time. Real estate will also be impacted. The change in the, re in the retail sector combined with the sudden realization that a significant number of people can work remotely will have an impact on, re on the real estate industry. We're not sure how much of the workforce will be asked or will request to work remotely when we are past this current pandemic, but it's probably not going to be zero. The oil industry, as we all well know, has been impacted. The domestic oil industry was hit with a terrible one-two punch during this, during this, uh, during the spring. First, the synchronized global shutdown that saw worldwide demand for oil fall by roughly 30 percent. Then Saudi Arabia and Russia just started a price war that flooded the world with unwanted oil. The collapse of oil prices from the $61 price at the start of 2020 to around $20, as this is written, will make it challenging for many domestic oil companies to keep their doors open. It will also have an impact on the financial institutions that have an unusually large amount of their loans made to these companies. We will need to see a dramatic increase in global demand just to allow us to have enough available storage to put all the excess oil. One sector that could actually benefit from the current conditions is healthcare. The constant, head, the constant headwinds since the early days of the Clinton administration on healthcare, and more specifically pharmaceutical companies, seems to be subsiding somewhat. It is now understood that the ability to quickly find solutions to new viruses is as much of a national security issue as a health issue. We all look with hope our, and promise to those companies to find a solution to the COVID-19 pandemic. The sudden glaring importance on a strong and robust drug and healthcare system should allow political cover that this sector has not seen in decades.